Good morning and welcome. I'm Bill Frist, Senior Fellow here at the Bipartisan Policy uh, Center, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to our event today, which uh, you're going to find enlightening. We're going to all learn something along the way based on what we've been working on for the last uh, nine months. Uh, for those of you who are new to BPC, our mission is to actively seek to combine the best ideas from bipartisan, yes, both parties, to promote health security and opportunity for all Americans. We drive principled and politically viable policy solutions through the power of analysis, through negotiation, and through advocacy. This event this morning is being streamed live online, and a recording will be available later this week. We invite you to interact with us on Twitter about today's event using hashtag BPC Live, BPC Live, and the handle at BPC underscore bipartisan, at BPC underscore bipartisan. All panelists will take questions following the second panel discussion. If you're watching online and have a question for any of our participants, you can tweet us as well, and we'll try to get to those during the Q&A. We're here today to release the final recommendation from the BPC SNAP Task Force. I was pleased to serve as co-chair along with my colleagues, former agricultural secretaries, Dan Glickman and Ann Veneman. We also worked with 10 additional task force members who are nationally known health and public health and social service policy experts and administrators. With us here today and along the front, front row, you might just raise your hand up quickly, Mariana Chilton, professor at Drexel University, the former National Commission on Hunger co-chair, Dan Crippen, former National Governors Association executive director and former CBO director, Kara Odom Walker, secretary, Delaware Department of Health and Social Services, Angela Rashidi, research fellow, AEI, former SNAP administrator, John Wernert, former secretary, Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. Laurie Witzel, director of policy research, American Heart Association. Unable to join us in, in Washington today, but on the task force as well. Karen DeSalvo, former U.S. Secretary, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Health, former director, New Orleans uh, Health Department. David uh, Krepcho, President and CEO, Second Harvest Food Bank of Central Florida, Richard Whitley, Director, Nevada Department of Health and Human Services, Norbert Wilson, Professor of Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. Well, I am personally uh, delighted about our time together this morning as we focus on bipartisan ways to significantly strengthen a program that we all know is vital, fundamental, essential uh, anti-poverty program by underscoring the critical nature and the critical influence that we know today, much more so than, than five or ten years ago, that influence, influence of nutrition and healthy foods. I say uh, personally because and I probably should say professionally as well as personally, because as a heart specialist, I've had the opportunity to operate on thousands of heart patients, on thousands of heart Medicaid patients. And I recognize as I've done that, as I reflect on in, in looking back, that poor nutrition and unhealthy foods strongly, strongly contribute to obesity and all of us know the obesity epidemic we have today. Approximately one-third of all Americans are obese. Because I'm aware that obesity drives up health care costs hugely, and it continues to do so. And those costs and spending is not just for the individual, but it's for society at large who pays for the subsidies to take care of the morbidity and ultimately the mortality of those obese patients. I recognize that poor nutrition and obesity lead to less productivity at work, to lead, it leads to more absenteeism at work, it leads to more type two diabetes, it leads to more heart attacks, it leads to more strokes, it leads to more premature deaths. And when you put that burden of disease 
uh, together, it leads to a huge cost. The $3.3 trillion of health care dollars that we spent for service, for service today, in large part, is driven by obesity. So two things. Yet America is facing an obesity crisis, and America is facing a health care cost crisis. In addition, we know that 65 percent, 65 percent of all adult Medicaid patients, recipients, receive SNAP benefits as well. And while most Americans, and I could, while most America could stand to eat better, several studies do indicate that SNAP recipients have diets that are slightly worse than similar individuals who are not participating in SNAP. So it was very clear very early on to our task force that we should focus on ways to improve nutrition in SNAP and also better align SNAP and Medicaid with the goal of improving health and at the same time lowering health care costs. As we debated these issues over the course of the past nine months, there was a shared appreciation among the task force members that SNAP has and continues to be a, a, a program that has, is hugely important by greatly improving food insecurity and reducing hunger for low-income Americans. So our mission was not to over, overhaul SNAP, but rather to focus on bipartisan ways that we could strengthen it and protect it, this essential anti-poverty program, by improving how it promotes nutrition for its roughly 40, 40 million participants. Now, to accomplish all this, we're coming to the report, which we'll talk much more about uh, shortly. We identified four major areas for action. First, we need to proactively prioritize, prioritize nutrition in SNAP. Second, we need to strengthen the SNAP education program. Third, we need to better align SNAP and Medicaid. And fourth, we need to improve coordination of federal and state agencies and programs. Well, some of our recommendations would result in some savings and others might cost a tad bit more. The report, this particular report, was not about a budget exercise. Rather, we believe, and we strongly believe as a group, that if these recommendations were adopted as a package, the resulting improvements in nutrition and diet-related disease would lead to reduced health care costs. Personally, when, when I considered uh, the thousands of Medicaid patients that I mentioned that I've operated on with, with uh, cardiovascular disease, um, I asked myself, how many of those costly operations those, uh, these are individuals, these expensive op operations could have been avoided if we had just paid better attention to balanced eating and to better nutrition in the food that we take in our bodies every day. You'll have the honor to hear much more about all, all of this uh, later this morning from my fellow co-chairs Ann Veneman and Dan Glickman and a panel of our task force members. Now I'd like to shift gears and introduce, and I'm honored to do this, to welcome and introduce our esteemed guest. We are joined today by Representative Jimmy Panetta from California's 20th District. Currently in his first term, Congressman Panetta serves on a number of committees, including the House Agriculture Committee and the Nutrition Subcommittee. As I'm sure you are all aware, SNAP is set to be reauthorized in the Farm Bill later this year. So I would like to invite Congressman Panetta to the stage to tell us more about the process and to share his priorities for SNAP, nutrition, and the Farm Bill as a whole. Congressman Panetta, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Senator Frist, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, the Bipartisan Policy uh, Committee, the BPC. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity uh, to be here today and to uh, talk to you uh, about my thoughts about uh, what's going on with SNAP, uh, my time in Congress. Uh, but I must first take this time to recognize, obviously, Secretary Veneman 
and uh, Secretary Glickman. Uh, it's amazing uh, that the farther you get away from home, the smaller you realize this world is. I guess Secretary Veneman's sister used to babysit me back on the <laughs> Central Coast. And uh, as many of you know, with Secretary Glickman, he not only was a classmate back in 1976 of the Young Turks with my father, uh, new representatives, but he also spoke at my law school graduation back in 1996. Uh, so it's great to see both of you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming here on this uh, Monday morning uh, after the uh, time change. I think we're all a little sleepy-eyed today. Uh, and to, uh, to listen to, to me, a freshman member, new to the Ag Committee. I'm sure you're all probably going, what the, why do I have to listen to this guy? Uh, what does he know? Well, I, I guess uh, the thing that's important to know is that I am a representative of the Central Coast of California, uh, California's 20th Congressional District. Uh, it has been my home, uh, the only home I have ever known. It was the home that my grandfather, an Italian immigrant, uh, came to back in 1921 uh, so that he could give his children a better life. And because, you know, he, we were always told growing up in the household that I had that because we were allowed to live the reality uh, of that dream, then we damn well better give back to the country and community that gave us so much. And so that's why I chose, chose to serve uh, and had the, have the fortunate opportunity right now to serve my hometown and to know that my two daughters, who are ages 11 and 13, are going to grow up in my same hometown, going to the same schools that I did, but more importantly, having that same sense of belonging uh, to the Central Coast of California. Because growing up there, you realize that that is an area that has a long, long tradition of groups of people coming there to fulfill that dream. And that means more than just reading about it in a Steinbeck novel. Uh, you, growing up there, you feel it. You know it. And you've seen that people always came there uh, to fulfill their goals. The Franciscans who built the missions, the Asians who built the railroads, uh, and participated in our agriculture, the Okies who were escaping the Dust Bowl, the Italians who ended up fishing there, and uh, as of this uh, late in the 20th century, a number of Latin Americans who came there for a better life. And you realize, though, that everybody in one form or the other who comes to the Central Coast of California, they participate in the number one industry and that's agriculture. Uh, we are blessed, yes, with being one of the most beautiful districts in the nation, but also one of the most bountiful. Uh, we have this confluence of valleys from the Salinas to the Santa Clara to the Pajaro to the San Juan that uh, kind of end up right there on the Central Coast and basically allow a number of areas to claim capitals. We have the artichoke capital of the world. We have the garlic capital of the world. We have the strawberry bowl of the world. And of course, of course, we have the salad bowl of the world. And so, yes, we are there on the Central Coast surrounded by fresh and healthy food from Cannery Row to east of Eden and to the pastures of heaven. Uh, yet you realize, though, that in growing up in a place like that, that there are people who are surrounded by food, healthy food, all day and work in producing healthy, nutritious food all day. You realize, though, that those same people, many of them, don't have access to that same type of healthy food. On the Central Coast, one in five children struggle with hunger. 15% of the residents on the Central Coast have food secure, have are food insecure. And 65% of that number, 65% are farm workers. Yet that is alleviated in a large percentage of the population who are recipients of the thing we're here to talk about today, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, Assistance Program, something that since 1977, Congress has worked across party lines so that all across our nation, from the Central Coast to the East Coast, working families, children, vets, seniors, and the disabled are not hungry. Today, nearly 42 million Americans rely on SNAP benefits for their families' food <laughs> security. But as we, knew, we know well, and as you're going to hear throughout the rest of the morning, SNAP also makes people more secure within our communities and allows them to be a part of our country's way of life. For as consumers in America, people need that freedom to make their own decisions for their families, for themselves. And with SNAP, I firmly believe that you have that 
because we have a program that not only promotes nutrition, it provides consumers with the opportunities for success. Now, as a member of the House Agriculture Committee, and as a member, more specifically, as a member of the Nutrition Subcommittee, I do believe that it is our responsibility to ensure that SNAP continues not just to succeed, but to be strengthened. Now, yes, when I first got to Washington, being on the Ag Committee was my number one choice, hands down, based on where I came from, of course, where I come from, where I represent. But I have to say, and, and I also heard that being on the Ag Committee, it's a very bipartisan committee. Democrats, Republicans, it's not really a party issue that comes to the, full, to the front. It's more of a regional issue that people are fighting over. But I have to say I was a little disheartened in the first meeting that I had with uh, Ranking Member Peterson. All the Democrats came together, and he gathered us in a room, and he talked about uh, what happened back in 2014 with the Farm Bill back then. And he said, I have to tell you, that if the majority wants to separate the, nu the nutrition title from the Farm Bill, then we are not going to have a Farm Bill. I was very disheartened by that conversation. I didn't know what to expect, especially as a freshman member coming into a committee that I wanted to be on, that I wanted to be bipartisan about. But I have to tell you that since then, in the first year on, my t on the committee, I was very heartened by the majority's decision to have hearings on the Farm Bill, in which one-third of the hearings, including 21 witnesses, were all about SNAP. And all but one witness was very, very positive about the program. Everybody understood. Everybody had that same attitude uh, that basically we need to not just keep SNAP around, but we do need to continue funding it accordingly. And that was the same attitude that uh, I've been hearing in my district, obviously growing up there, but also in the past year. I had an ag listening session out in Salinas where I brought in the ranking member and a couple other uh, congressional members, and they basically heard the same thing. There was that consensus of how important SNAP is, uh, not just to stopping hunger, but to our communities. But unfortunately, <clears throat> as we are seeing, it doesn't seem that anybody in the administration uh, has been listening or heard any of those uh, hearings because based on the budget that was put out there, they uh, proposed to cut the SNAP budget by $210 billion over the next decade. And they wanted to completely change the type of food recipients get and how they get it. And that was put forward with this proposal that I'm sure we've all heard about called the Harvest Box. Um, something that was basically supposed to be a periodically sent out cardboard box filled with cheap peanut butter, canned goods, uncooked pasta, dry cereal, and something called shelf-stable milk. And yes, it wasn't filled with any fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, Secretary Purdue called this a bold idea. Uh, OMB uh, Director Mulvaney called it kind of the blue apron of SNAP, I guess. Uh, when I heard that, I thought about uh, my wife and I won one of these box food, we food boxes uh, for a couple months uh, through a contest that we signed up for. And I can tell you not once did we end up cooking <laughs> what they gave us. And I can tell you that many of the items they gave us, we didn't even know what the hell they were. And now they're just filling space in our cabinet, unfortunately. Um, and so, uh, but I also kind of thought it through a little bit, and I said, oh, well, something else has got to be going on here. Maybe this is just sort of a, a distraction. It gets the Democrats so focused on this harvest box that we end up giving in on other areas in cuts to the SNAP, to SNAP. But I said that to somebody, and they said, no, you're giving them too much credit. And I do believe that because we have not heard about this harvest box much lately. Because I do believe that that one size box uh, to kind of that fitting all approach, it hinders the ability of recipients to determine what is best for themselves and what is best from their families. And this type of idea does not take into account the business lost at supermarkets, at mom and pop corner markets, at rural markets, and yes, at farmers markets. And I do believe that it limits the access to a variety of foods like the fresh fruits and vegetables that are grown in my district. 
And I've always thought, uh, and thank goodness I've seen it come to fruition, that my role uh, on the Ag Committee as a representative of the salad bowl of the world is not to limit people's options to a box of dry food, but my role is to fight for their choice for fresh food. And so that is why I am a big supporter of the Food Insecurity and Nutrition Incentive, FINNI, which I'm sure we've all heard of here in this room. I believe that FINNI embodies the benefits that SNAP can provide to many cultures of our communities and also the many facets to our economy. I saw this firsthand in Gilroy, uh, California, the garlic capital of the world. Uh, there at the Arteaga's a Mexican supermarket, they have been get granted uh, one of these Finney grants so that their market can offer SNAP recipients what's called double up bucks. Basically, it allows recipients to use their SNAP benefits for certain fruits and vegetables. You get two for one. You get two for one. Uh, it provides incentives for families to choose fresh, local, locally produced products, and it allowed Arteaga's to increase its sales of those types of products. You realize that SNAP is not just an anti-hunger program. It is an anti-poverty program. That SNAP does help beneficiaries not just eat healthy, but it allows them to get back on their feet and get back out into the community. SNAP education that teaches recipients how to eat healthier and provides them budgeting skills to make SNAP benefits go further. SNAP employment and training programs, they help SNAP, SNAP recipients prepare for future careers with basic skills, based training, and partnerships with local industries. Now, I think we all appreciate that gut reaction about able bodies. And I think we all agree with the sentiment behind giving people a hand up rather than just a handout. And I think that the best anti-poverty program is, of course, a job. But we also know that that is easier said than done. And when you start making changes to and start taking away benefits from a program that touches so many communities and lies across so many cultures, the reaction gets very emotional very, very quickly. I saw this last week in a meeting that I attended, Democrats and Republicans, where we did start to talk about what could be coming down the pike this week with the release of the Farm Bill. And it did get very emotional. But as a former prosecu prosecutor, what I saw worked in courtroom is not my ability to stand up in court and claim that someone is guilty never worked that way, but my ability to actually present evidence to the jury upon which they could then make a decision. And what I have seen that based on the evidence that has been put forward in the hearings in Congress or in California and the witnesses I've heard from in the Ag Committee to my constituents that I've heard from on the Central Coast, I believe that based on the evidence, the best thing that I can do for SNAP is to work in a bipartisan manner to address our hunger at home and to improve the recipient's long-term well-being through educational programs. I firmly believe that SNAP is not just about putting food in people's stomachs. It is about putting knowledge in their heads and giving them the confidence in their heart to step up and step out into the community. Because I've seen, even on the Central Coast, even when surrounded by healthy and nutritious food, all day, people need to understand and know what and how to eat healthy at dinner at night. Because with SNAP, with SNAP, we know that one of the best ways to prevent hunger is to improve the recipient's ability to fight for a job. That's what we need to help them do. And it reminds me of a joke that I'm sure Secretary Glickman often heard my father tell about a rabbi and a priest who wanted to get to know each other better. And so they go to a boxing match. And right before the bell rings, one of the boxers makes a sign of the cross. And the rabbi nudges a priest and says, what the hell does that mean anyway? And the priest says, not a damn thing if he can't fight. <laughs> we need to be able to give people that will, that knowledge to fight. We must prepare them for that, and I believe that SNAP 
does that physically and mentally. It helps recipients stand on their own. It helps recipients fight for their own. And that is why I will continue to fight for SNAP. Thank you. I've, I've been told we got a couple minutes for a, just a couple questions. Please, ma'am. Hi, Stacy Bridges with Veterans Vision. You talked about SNAP um, ending poverty, but there are a lot of military men and women, as well as police officers and teachers, okay. as well as people who work uh, at corporations who are underpaid who receive SNAP. Um, have you thought about um, the other thing that's causing obesity too? Is these antipsychotic drugs that cause obesity or cause diabetes that could be a factor, as well as cutting. On gym for kids to go out and work and exercise. Um, are we gonna? I, I really like your idea about it is an education thing. What are we gonna do to team up with education and you know smart eating so that people can make the right choices? Um, maybe a, a cookbook might be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. No, I look. I think uh, obviously there are a number of things to take into account um, in, in our capacity and. In putting forward the farm bill and dealing with the nutrition title, it's uh, I believe right now it's continuing to focus on the education programs. What I can tell you, I, I admit, I mean I, I'm really lucky coming from uh, the Central Coast. Uh, we have a number of programs that get young children starting to think about the way they eat, and I'm telling you, it's these children who then bring home these these mannerisms or these methods to their family members. Uh, and teach their family, their mothers and fathers, about how to eat healthy. We have started an initiative uh, in, on the Central Coast that is uh, private companies have put forward a number of salad bars in local schools. I think there's probably about 40 salad bars uh, in local schools that these kids start to eat uh, you know, healthy through these salad bars that are they're given that option to have a salad bar at lunch. Uh, and from that, we've seen it basically transcend into the home front. Um, on top of that, in the hearings that I did have in the Ag Committee, that we did have in the Ag Committee, uh, the fact that people were full-time full, full employed, yet still on food stamps, came up quite often. And that is something that I, I believe uh, the policymakers understand and know that that's something that, uh, you know, needs to be addressed, definitely. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is, yes, my name is Nora Delury. Um, I wanted to ask you, given that you're um, from the Central Coast and you talk so much about the, um, that most, you know, so much of our food that is grown is coming from the Central Coast. Um, much of that food is harvested, when you discuss, is harvested by immigrants. And I wondered if you would comment on changes of immigration policy and how that could both impact the food insecurity of the immigrants themselves, their children, but also the rest of us. Thank you for that question. Um, look, I, I, it, was, it was interesting. When I, when I was, uh, prior to being Congress, uh, I took an ag, an ag focus class, basically. It was a wonderful opportunity for people in the community to actually, one time a month, get out into our agricultural community. It was great. And during that time, California had been enduring a, a very serious drought. And you thought, being in this area, on the Central Coast, that water might be the number one issue. Not at all. Back then, and even worse now, the number one issue in facing our agriculture producers right now is the lack of immigration reform that uh, unfortunately has not gone on uh, here in Washington, D.C. And so I get hit on every single time I'm back home by farmers of what the hell's gonna happen uh, with that. We are letting our crops go fallow. Millions and millions of dollars of crops unpicked because they don't have the labor force to do it. I mean, out there, as I hear you heard, we have specialty crops out there. We just cannot send a machine through the fields to pick our crops. It doesn't work that way. We have crops that literally go from the field into the cartons, to the shelves of the store, into my daughter's mouths. And so you need that human sight, sense, touch to understand what's gonna be aesthetically pleasing, what's gonna be healthy to the consumer. And unfortunately, 
we've relied on an immigration an immigrant workforce to be that, uh, those workers, to do that job. Uh, yet with the shrinking and aging workforce that we have now, it's clear that, that this is a problem. It's clear that immigration reform needs to be done. The last time it was done, 1986 under President Ronald Reagan. Uh, and unfortunately, what I've seen on an issue, not even dealing with ag labor force, but the dreamers issue that we've all heard about, what I saw in my efforts on that issue is that that is a very, very politically sensitive and policy complex topic to deal with. And I believe that led, unfortunately, to nothing happening. But I just hope that people continue to get the word out of how important it is, obviously not just for the dreamers, but for our communities, for our economy, especially in ag. But I think there's a two-way uh, approach here. One, yes, is immigration reform. But two, is mechanization. I hate to say it. These types of crops are very difficult to mechanize, but you're seeing the Salinas Valley extend that bridge over to the Silicon Valley, which is just north of us, and start these sort of ag tech research project, projects, privately funded research projects. And so we are seeing uh, machines that can kind of pick strawberries or getting there. It's very, very difficult. We're seeing machines uh, cut lettuce heads and the developments from them, the research from them in the sense that basically they had a water slicer uh, basically slice heads of lettuce, but they realized it was cutting too deep into the ground. So then they uh, modified, genetically modified, the heads of lettuce to look like light bulbs. So they kind of went up a little bit, give more of a neck so it's easier to cut off and then process. So it's these types of, uh, re this type of research that's, that's happening uh, in spite or in light of the fact that nothing's being done on immigration. Uh, it is a huge issue. It's going to continue to be a huge issue if Democrats and Republicans can't come together on this. And it's going to be something that's going to affect, like I said, not just our communities, uh, not just our economy, but I believe our country. Thank you very much.